Greetings folks and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and Lovely. Now we had to have a little break last week because times are very, very busy here. Um, but I'm very glad to be back this week and we have a really interesting show with some stuff that we don't usually cover on the Electromaker Show and I'm really excited to share it with you. With that said, there's a lot to get through so let's get straight on with it. Now, we're going to start this week's show by taking a brief look at the winners of the Electromaker of the Month contest for April. A very quick primer, in case you're not familiar with this, every month uh, we celebrate the top three projects on Electromaker. There is a separate panel of judges, thankfully I don't want to have to make those decisions, um, that decide on three projects worthy of note. And the top prize wins a bunch of gear from Nordic Semiconductor, including the Fantastic Thingy 91, the Tile, um, and the NRF 5340 development kit, um, all of which can do lots of lovely cellular IoT and Bluetooth low energy things. Um, and uh, second place also wins a bunch of swag from Nordic Semiconductor, um, as well as uh, a bunch of swag from us at Electromaker as well, including these rather swaggy Electromaker t-shirts. Um, yes, the contest itself is fantastic, but what I really want to talk about now is the actual things that won first, second and third this week, because they're all amazing for their different reasons. I'm going to start with third place. Now, this is Fred, and Fred, as you can see, is a robotic hand. But what makes Fred special is that this is a robotic hand that's being controlled using just hobby servos and essentially tendons. Um, it's designed around the biometrics of an actual human hand because essentially each finger has a, te a tendon above it and below it. And then between, now let me get these words right, flexion and dorsiflexion. I did not get that. I just said flexion twice, didn't I? Um, the biomechanical way that fingers work is how this works. Um, now this is all 3D printed parts all very cheap stuff, and this was done by a class of school children in Paris. This is an incredible amount of engineering, and it absolutely uh, deserves uh, to be celebrated. It really is fantastic. This project um, is from uh, Remy, um, Remy, Remy Mazha. Um, and if you want to see the project, um, I'll leave a link to this blog article, which, uh, which talks about all of it in the description of the video. You can just click Fred, and it will show you the project just here, including how they thought about it and how it worked. And let me just fix this. The extensor tendon and the flexor tendon, that's what I was trying to say before. In second place is Electro Japanese Pool Billiards, and I'm not going to actually talk about this much now because I talked about this on our previous show. But in short, it is a fantastic build um, that uh, emulates uh, billiards, but in miniature format, has a very inventive system for checking whether the balls are in the right places and is playable by up to four people, um, and it absolutely deserved its second place prize. In first place, however, is this amazing project from Nick Rame. Um, he has fitted a, uh, an Ecrano plan um, with machine learning, um, which blows my mind. That's a sentence I never thought I'd say. <laughs> so Ecrano plans, let's start with that. Ecrano plans are planes that are sort of seen as boats. Interestingly, um, in maritime law, I, I think they are classed as boats rather than planes. I read that uh, when I was researching this. Um, and basically, they use the air cushion underneath them uh, as, a, as a way of moving efficiently. They're very interesting things in and of themselves. The history of Ecrano plans is, yeah, it's something worth reading up. This video specifically is um, a collaboration with another YouTuber who makes uh, remote control planes and is making a large scale remote control Ecrano plan. What Nick has done is made a small scale model that works, which is engineeringly fantastic in and of itself, engineeringly, and uses a Raspberry Pi 4 in order to get it to follow him by tracking an April tag that he has on his back. In fact, if I just jump back to the very start of the video, you will see that in action. Yeah, that's the April tag. Um, there's so much I love about this project. And uh, uh, when I saw this one, I, there was a part of me that kind of thought, I wonder if the judges are going to pick that as the winner, because it is such a fantastic project. Um, again, uh, in this blog post, you can click on the titles and it will take you to the project so you can read a bit more about them. Um, and uh, Nick Rame has a YouTube channel. As you can see, he uh, submitted a video with the project, um, which is, uh, again, fascinating. Um, and uh, I, I'm kind of new to the RC side of things. Um, but yeah, I... I, I I'm very interested in the way that this is put together. It's something that I feel like might become a slight obsession of mine, albeit one that I mostly fulfill by just watching videos of it. <laughs> but yes, um, they were the three winners for this month. Um, and it still, I feel like I say this every month and I might be becoming a bit of a stuck record, but I am so glad that we are in a position where we can reward people for just being awesome and putting their stuff up on our website. Um, if you want to take part in this competition, you don't have to actually do anything specific. Everything that gets accepted as a project under the community tab um, is, is in. It's in the running. 
Um, so every uh, everything that's here, you can see uh, any one of these things potentially could win. The judges go through at the end of the month and look through, and they pick ones that uh, have a variety of different uh, facets to them. Be it they're very crafty, they take a lot of engineering, uh, they take a lot of programming skill. Um, yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I'm really glad that I don't have to think about and judge. I just get to talk about it with a lot of glee. But if you would like to be in the running to win the next Electromaker of the Month, because as the name suggests, we do this every month. All you need is a free Electromaker account and then upload your project to our site by going under the community and clicking upload project or just clicking upload projects here. It doesn't have to be finished. It doesn't have to be an amazing craft thing that you've put together that looks like a real product. Um, it just has to be you documenting your work. And if that means you're documenting the first day you get an Arduino out of the packet and you manage to reprogram it with your own custom code, we want to see that. In fact, we want to see that just as much as the amazing finished project because at the end of the day, we're all at our own level. Um, and I know that there's some stuff that I'm very scared of trying to do because I'm not smart enough at this particular point in my life to do it, but I'm going to learn and I want to share that process with you when I have the time to. Um, and I'm very interested in seeing where you are right now in terms of your DIY projects, your maker projects, what you are making now. We have featured Handy Geng on this show before. Um, he has been dubbed the useless Edison of China, although I find that to be a while a fun name, not accurate, um, a lot of his inventions are very useful. The last time we talked about him, he turned an electric vehicle, i.e. a Tesla battery, into the biggest power bank you have ever seen. Uh, if you want to go back a few episodes and watch that, you can see him dragging it behind him. It was quite a thing to behold. Uh, this is probably one of the most functional things I've ever seen him make, and it is incredible. Um, it is a phone case that he machined out of aluminium that has a small dynamo and a spring inside it and a few uh, different cogs for gearing. That means that when you open and close the case, it will charge your phone. Now, this is a short video, but it's definitely worth watching all the way through. There's a link to it in the description. Um, and as you can see, there's a various gearing on there, um, and there's also a light and um, a little charge circuit. And there you go. He opened the case once, and his phone is showing as a receiving charge. And it is charging his phone. It's not going to do it particularly quickly, but this is a phone charger that requires no power. There's no solar panels. There's nothing like that. This is just a mechanical charger. It's not the first of its kind, but to hand machine something that your phone fits in like that, is amazing. It's incredible. I really enjoy Handy Gang. His videos are very funny as well. Um, he just seems like my kind of maker. Really, really, really cool uh, project. <laughs> this might be one of my favorite things I have ever seen, actually. <laughs> Now, moving swiftly on, I'm not going to spend too much time on this section because I want you to go and watch this video yourself. Um, because this is uh, the Develop It uh, YouTube channel, or Develop IT, um, and uh, essentially talking about the Raspberry Pi Pico from the perspective of someone who, like many on the internet, had kind of, kind of dismissed it because the ESP32 is clearly so much more powerful. ESP32 has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in. It has a dual-core microprocessor that can do amazing things, and they're very, very quick. Um, and while the RP2040 is impressive in its own way, there's no onboard connectivity with the Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, and so I can understand why, at the time of its release, there were a lot of people under YouTube videos and in forums. It became the rallying cry of people, just use an ESP32, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. However, this video is fantastic because if you had wondered why you'd ever bother with the Raspberry Pi Pico over the ESP32, it very clearly explains why. And the answer, unsurprisingly to those in the know, is the PIO, the Programmable Input-Output Interface, which allows you to do a huge amount without really bothering the onboard CPU too much. And in this video, uh, the instance used is um, uh, rendering VGA. Um, rendering VGA is, is a surprisingly heady task for a microcontroller to do. Whereas here, he's showing that this is uh, um, VGA rendering quickly in a way that doesn't bother the main microcontroller all that much so you can do all of your actual program logic and calculations on the main CPU or MCU while the PIO does all the hard work. Um, it's a seven minute video, but it is absolutely worth listening to every second. It's a clear uh, a, a explanation of why the Pi Pico is worth picking. And of course, uh, a little dip into develop IT's ongoing project, which looks like it's going to be very interesting indeed. Up next, we are taking a slight departure from the usual Electromaker show fair, and that is because we're going to the YouTube channel of the Cathode Ray Dude. Now, if you're not familiar, this is a goldmine of retro tech, um, and uh, there are many channels like this on the internet. I particularly like this channel because of the clear way everything um, is expressed and talked about, um, and there's a, a certain humor to it I love it as well. But this one is about CDRs, um, rewritable CDs. Now, I am the exact correct age to be someone that had books and spindles, thousands, literally of CDRs, um, uh, just containing data, containing music. Um, there was a time where pretty much everything that I uh, kind of had personally cared about, uh, things, I would, things I would write, my diary, all that kind of stuff, was on an encrypted CDR. 
Um, and that is what this video specifically is about. Encrypted CDRs or a very specific and weird product that should be an encrypted CDR and it turns out is actually rubbish. Anyhow, enough of my waffling. The video itself is just superb. It's one of the best things I've watched on YouTube in a very long time. Um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, just to go through some of the uh, chapters on this, it kind of gives you the overview of how CDRs work and then how rewritable CDs work, so-called hybrid disks and multi-session uh, multi disks, how the multi-session concept works, some misconceptions people have about how rewritable disks work because you weren't actually rewriting rewritable disks. But I will let the cathode radio explain exactly what that is. And then moving on to this incredible product um, called the uh, Encryptees from Rico, um, which is sort of an insane idea, but a very cool idea, which is a fully encrypted CDR. Um, and at a certain time in history, that would be very, very important to a lot of businesses. There is, however, a very large problem, and I will leave it up to you to watch the video to find out what that is. But yes, if you are a fan of retro tech as I am, especially older computers, you will love the Cathode Ray Dude channel. Um, I will leave a link to this video in the description of our video, and of course, you can head over and subscribe to his channel from there. If you are enjoying the Electromaker show, it would help us out a lot if you could subscribe to the Electromaker YouTube channel. Under the video, there is a big fancy subscribe button, and next to that, there is a little bell. Now, if you do select all notifications here, you will only get notifications within YouTube, but it means when you come to the site, if we have a new episode out, it will show up here. As you can see, one of the things that we also have now is our secondary series called Electromaker Educates. Now, these are infrequent videos, but they're from Robin, who is an engineer who has way more knowledge than I do, um, and they are very, very interesting videos indeed. Um, but as you can see, the only thing showing up here is the Electromaker show and uh, these Electromaker Educates videos. You won't be spammed with uh, uh, loads of things from us. And the final thing you can do on YouTube is click the like button. Everyone is sick of YouTubers asking for likes and subscribes, but there is a reason they do. Um, it is all algorithm based these days after all, and it make, makes it far more likely that other like-minded people will be recommended our video if you click like, subscribe and do the thing with the bell. That said, by far the best thing you can do to support this show, and if you only choose to do one thing, it would be buy things from our store. Electromaker does not put adverts on our videos. Uh, we do not have a Patreon, we do not ask for donations, we don't do any of that kind of stuff, um, and unless we need to, we don't plan to either. Uh, right now we have a shop um, with a surprisingly large amount of things in stock given the current situation, and as you can see with the names scrolling across the top of the screen, we have quite a lot of stuff from a lot of people, whether you are a hobbyist just getting started or doing some quite serious stuff or prototyping for your company, consider getting things from electromaker.io instead. Everything that gets spent in the shop goes towards making the Electromaker website better. It allows us to do community projects and also things like um, giveaways for our community and uh, run the contests, everything that we do here, including the show. So um, the things on YouTube would be very nice uh, uh, to do and buying things from our store will help us out tremendously. None of these things are absolutely mandatory, of course. This is a free show and it always will be. Um, but yes, anyway, thank you so much for listening. I will get on with the rest of the show now. Now we're moving on to the part of the show that is called Funding Website Things, but interestingly, we're not actually going to start on a funding website today. Instead, we'll be starting with a product that is now for sale and that you can buy, but which is something that actually went through crowdfunding some time ago. I honestly can't remember if we covered it on the show at the time or not, but it's a project that's been on my periphery for a while that I've been wanting to speak about, so it's going in this section. And the project is papered.ink. Now, um, I am a big fan of these e-paper displays with a microcontroller built into it that are kind of easy to use, get off the ground, um, and that you can develop with and do completely your own thing with, but that are also kind of supposed to be a bit easier to use. Um, so you don't have to completely roll your own from scratch. Because at the end of the day, we could all just go out and buy an e-ink display, buy an MCU, get a custom PCB printed and do it all ourselves. But who has the time to do that? Well, certainly not me currently. You'll also know if you've watched the show for a while that I'm a big fan of these things. We've talked at length about ink plate, and in fact we have some interesting ink plate news coming up, but we'll leave that for when the time is right. The fact is that these things uh, have great uh, pot potential uses, especially in things like a smart home. A lot of people just stick a tablet up on the wall, um, an old tablet, and use that as their smart home interface, which is fine. Um, but it's a bit of a waste of power um, and also in the middle of the night the last thing you want to do is turn on a tablet screen that's going to blast your eyes out when all you want to do is turn the hallway lights down or up or set an alarm, you know, that kind of thing. That's where these things really come into their own. So if you are interested in this, um, I'll leave a link to it in the description, although as you can see it's just papered.ink is the website. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a small team behind this as far as I can tell. Um, and they've been at it for quite some time. I think their initial funding campaign was a couple of years ago. And I, um, and I think even at the time they didn't make their entire goals and they've stuck with this project. 
Um, uh, which is just, yeah, why I finally wanted to kind of put it on the Electromaker show. I don't have anything specific to say about it because I haven't had one in my hands yet. I'm hoping to get my hands on one, um, A, to have a play with, and B, to hopefully give away. Um, but that's all coming um, in the future. Um, for now, um, yeah, Paper.ink is the latest in a line of microcontrollers with e-paper displays, and it's a form factor and an idea that I really, really like. Up next, we're on crowd supply for Sharp Picibo, which is fun to say and also fun to look at because this is uh, exactly the kind of thing that I love. It is a Linux computer, but it also looks kind of like a, a hobby kit that you would build your own calculator sort of thing. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, this is an e-ink display portable Linux machine. It's powered by a Raspberry Pi Zero, I think the 2W variation, if I uh, believe. But I imagine it would be um, uh, compatible with any Raspberry Pi Zero, I should think. And it has a little e-ink display. And as you can see, this is just a raw PCB with a bunch of buttons on it. But this is a full QWERTY keyboard. Um, it also has a LoRa module um, and a little antenna here for long range uh, uh, connectivity with, via Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, it's a very nice small Linux machine. And the thing I think I like about it the most is that um, it's truly functional in that this is, uh, you know, you could do everything you need to do in the terminal. It is a working keyboard. Not only that, it's designed so that when you plug it into something else, it will act as a USB keyboard. Um, the example they give here is if you're working on rack server mounts and you need to plug into the rack server, um, uh, you can use this just as a keyboard in, in place, which is a very nice uh, idea. Now, as you can see, this is a pre-launch page, so there's no uh, price on this yet. You can, of course, sign up for it here. Um, and this is from Morpheans, who we've talked about on the show before. Um, they were one of the first people, I, uh, to my knowledge at least, to put out um, one of the boards for the ESP32 S2 variation, um, which also had a nice little display on it. It had a full color display. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, they, they've put out a lot of stuff before. Um, so if you are interested in finding out more, I will of course leave a link to this in the description of the video. You can enter your email address here. Um, but the uh, Sharp Pikibo or the Sha the Sha RPI Kibo, if you want to say the Raspberry Pi part of it, will be coming to Crowd Supply fairly soon. Just before moving on, one thing I meant to mention but realized I completely forgot to is that this, uh, of course, being so small and portable, um, is portable. There, there will be an onboard battery that you can charge. Um, it, in fact, says down here in the notes, draws power and charges it charges its battery through a USB Type-C connector. We like USB Type-C. And um, in case you're wondering about GPIO access and all this kind of stuff, um, it shows uh, that, yeah, there's a, there's a various uh, UART and I2C available through GPIO for external 3.3 or 5 volt modules. Um, uh, and also an interesting controllable GPIO voltage detection system. Not sure exactly what that means, but I'm sure we'll find out more when this goes live. Now, this is normally the part of the show where we would have the mystery box competition, which is a competition where I pull prizes out of a mystery box and give them away at random to people who commented on our previous show. However, this week things are a little bit different because we have a much smaller mystery box. However, it will not remain a mystery for long. Um, earlier on in this show, I talked about papered.ink and I also mentioned the wonderful people at Inkplate. And I have been waiting to give away some of these for quite some time. Um, this is the ink plate color. Now, um, I don't know how well you can see this. I don't want to open it because it's in a, a fully sealed box. But this is a, a color e-ink display. And color e-ink displays are super, super interesting things. But the beauty of it is, is that since this is an ink plate product, it is a color e-ink display, which on the back has a micro SD port, um, a USB-C port, and an ESP32 processor. This thing is just a few short bits of programming away from already just working and doing what it's supposed to. It is a wonderful thing that works pretty much straight out of the box, has Arduino support. I could go on about it all day. Um, however, what I will do is I will leave a link to the uh, original Crowd Supply page for this uh, uh, this um, ink plate. This is the ink plate six color, by the way, in case you're looking for the exact model. Um, I will leave a link to the Crowd Supply page in the bottom, but this is what we are giving away on this week's show. Um, and if you would like to enter, this is a bit different to the Mystery Box competition. This one, there's a specific thing that you need to do. And that first thing is be a subscriber to Electromaker. Um, this competition is open to all people who are subscribed to the Electromaker YouTube channel. And then all you need to do is scroll down to the comment section of this video and leave me a comment telling me what you would do if you won an ink plate six color and also leave the hashtag ink plate, I-N-K-P-L-A-T-E. 
that was way harder for me to work out how to spell than it should have been. Um, and we will, uh, either next week or the week after, we will be drawing a winner out of the box. Um, uh, well, not out of the box, out of the comment section. And someone will, of course, walk away with the ink plate. Um, this is one of my favorite things that we've uh, that we've had to give away. Um, I, I do have um, a different version of the ink plate. I have a much earlier version um, that I've played with uh, on and off. And they're just so much easier to use than most other things. I, I do actually have a color e-ink display as well sitting on the shelf over there. But man, getting that thing going has been an absolute nightmare. Uh, there's just no documentation for it. Whereas this thing just works pretty much straight out of the box. They are lovely, lovely things. And the people at Inkplate were nice enough to send this to me specifically to give away on the show, which I'm very glad that I'm finally able to do. We're going to close out the show by talking about a few extra things I saw on the internet this week that didn't really fit into any other part of the show. Um, and we're starting off with a story uh, or a blog post that I read on Medium. Um, about something that you may have heard about. Um, so we have avoided talking about the current conflict that's going on in the world right now on the show because it's not the place of an embedded hardware show to talk about that kind of stuff. And also, frankly, I don't know about you, but one of the things I enjoy about doing this is that I don't have to look at the wider news while I'm working on this show. I can just look at the things that I'm interested in. However, there was a story that was really quite interesting. When I first heard it, it just sounded like such a wonderful comeuppance. So the beginning of this Medium blog post uh, outlines basically what this CNN uh, news article reports, which is that during uh, the Ukrainian invasion, um, Russian soldiers facilitated the stealing of $5 million worth of John Deere farming equipment and shipped them to Chechnya, only to find that John Deere had remotely killed them. They'd used a remote kill switch to make them useless, just, just piles of steel and rubber by the time they got there. Um, and on the surface, you know, this is a very obvious story where there's a good guy and a bad guy and the bad guy got their comeuppance and that's a really good thing, right? Sort of. The article goes on to point out that John Deere uh, doesn't do this uh, specifically to thwart Russian looters. It was inv invented to thwart American farmers. And there's a reason why a lot of people have highlighted that sentence. Because unfortunately, uh, as the article goes into, John Deere is one of many companies who started out in cooperation with their customer base and now are using them as a way of wringing more and more revenue out of them. This show is not the place for me to go into my feelings about how global agriculture works. It is something I know actually a surprising amount. Um, it's something that I used to be quite passionate about, um, specifically the actions of companies like Monsanto and the way that they sell their products and the kind of products they sell to farmers. Unfortunately, John Deere is very guilty of this. Uh, what used to be a cooperative uh, way of working where the farmers knew what they needed out of their machinery, and so John Deere would try and provide that, has turned into a, a horrific control system where the sensors on these tractors can tell you so much these days. You can plow a field with a tractor and the sensor data you get will teach you more than you could possibly imagine if only the farmers and the people who actually would benefit from it benefit from it directly in any way, but they do not. That data belongs to John Deere, and their app is specifically bundled in some way with Monsanto. I can't remember what it is. Anyway, I could talk about this, rant about this. The point is, this brings to mind uh, several things about the, the idea of the Internet of Things and the idea of always connected items and the idea uh, that, you know, most of the things that we're buying these days have a lot of that built into it. It is likely that whatever car you buy next will have a similar system into it where it can be updated over the air. And if that update from the vendor is to stop that car working, there is little that you will be able to do about it. And that's not even to mention things like I talked about a, a little while ago, like Insteon or Instaon or whatever they called themselves, the IoT company who sold light switches and hubs and routers and smart thermostats that went under, went into administration, claimed everything was working fine, but quietly turned off their servers in the background. Um, and if it wasn't for the fantastic work of uh, the community and, of course, the home assistant community, yeah, pe people's entire smart homes would have been bricked. Um, this is the tip of an iceberg and we're still kind of discovering the whole iceberg for want of a better metaphor. It is a very interesting read and I will leave a link to it in the description of the video. Um, I'm not really interested in getting into any kind of pol political or philosophical debates in the comment section, um, but if there are other examples of this kind of thing that you are aware of, I would like to hear about them. We wouldn't necessarily cover them on the show, but it is something that I am loosely interested in um, because I am a big fan of the Internet of Things. I'm a big fan of the idea that things can always be connected. But what I'm not a big fan of is the things that humans are capable of when there is a lot of money involved. Now back to our more regular scheduled programming for the Electromaker show. Um, this article in All About Circuits is a brief rundown of some of the things from the Qualcomm, or Qualcomm depending on your locale, uh, conference that happened last week. 
Um, this was the 5G Summit, and as you can see from the uh, the headline, 5G AI marriage is the theme of the 2022 Qualcomm 5G Summit. Now, Qualcomm are one of those really big names um, that if you aren't really thinking about it, you might wonder why they are so big, but the simple fact of it is, is that it's almost certainly the phone you have in your pocket has one of their processors in it. They make the Snapdragon processors that are the backbone of pretty much every major mobile phone and tablet at the minute. Um, and this particular summit, um, if, if, you, if it was to be summed up, there's a lot of very interesting stuff here that's worth uh, reading. Um, uh, and uh, one of the things I love about this site, by the way, is that they do manage to get quite complicated information across very simply. Um, it's really well written, this article by, by Jeff Child. Um, but yes, if I had to sum it up uh, here, it says... Summarize today's announcements. This event, this year's event, leans into the reality that 5G is becoming mainstream. Today, the company made a series of announcements all within the theme of 5G and artificial uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, paraphrasing edge AI, um, edge AI and robotics. And that is the way everything is going. 5G is speedy enough to do fast data transfer, but edge AI means that you don't necessarily have to send things to the cloud all the time, saving bandwidth. That's the direction everything is going. Being able to do at least a certain amount of uh, inference on pre-trained models in the field, on phones, for example, um, and using 5G to communicate at high speeds. Um, and yeah, it's just a really nice rundown of everything that was happening at the conference. I did know that this conference was happening, but I didn't really think that we would be able to cover it. And luckily, All About Circuits has picked the pertinent information out and reported on it for us. So I will leave a link to this article in the description of the video. We are going to close out this week's show by talking about Arduino. And we're going to talk about the Potenta X8 again. Now, we did talk about this briefly during Arduino week when it was announced. But there's a new blog post on the Arduino blog um, about the Potenta X8 and a new Max carrier board, which is a fantastic uh, peripheral filled thing that you can put your Arduino uh, Potenta X8 and H7s on. And this graphic kind of tells you everything you need to know, actually. Here is your Potenta X8 or H7. I believe they're compatible to with both. Um, and uh, this is just kind of everything that you would ever need to attach to it to test it. Um, you could just use this board in place as the thing that you uh, put in your factory or in your uh, smart home setup, or, or you could just use it for prototyping. The point is, um, everything pretty much that the X8 can do, this board will give you access to. Now, before we move on to the Max board, I just wanted to quickly talk about the X8 itself, because um, at the time, I think I said something like this. Um, and I, when it was announced, and I, I felt like after the fact that I'd, I'd been a bit silly by saying it, because I, if I remember, I said something to the effect of it, the Potenta H7 with a single board computer attached to it. Uh, but it really is sort of how it is. It's kind of incredible in that this is a single board computer. This is a Linux single board computer using an NXP um, IMX 8M mini chip. It's a, a quad core, uh, speedy little SBC, basically, but with an STM32H7 attached to it as well. It's incredible the amount of stuff that's in these tiny little boards because they are quite small. They're not that much bigger than your kind of Ad Adafruit feather size thing. They're longer and a little wider, but they're, you know, still quite small, certainly smaller than uh, most single board computers are at least. Anyway, this blog post really is about the Potenta Max Carrier, and this is what we are going to have a quick look at now. Um, now, as you can see, there's a bunch of stuff already uh, on board that are kind of obvious. You can see this is a, attaching a battery. Uh, there's different kinds of serial port uh, that you can attach to it. There's audio ins and outs as well. Um, but there's a few interesting sides to it as well uh, that I kind of think are amazing that they fitted them onto a baseboard. So all the initial stuff, some of which I already mentioned, um, they have the um, uh, yeah the audio interface, as I mentioned here. These Potenta high-density connectors are the things that are on the bottom of the Potenta, and they're not just similar to the same kind of ones you find on the bottom of the con Compute Module 4 or any of the Compute Modules from Raspberry Pi, really. Um, but things get interesting when you look at the other things that are on this board. So there is a, a long-range capability built into the base board. And as it says here, there's also CAT M1 and NB-IoT, and CAT M1 is the same as LTE. Uh, one LTEM, sorry, um, and uh, here is a, a MPCI with a nano SIM. This is all stuff that's designed to make this baseboard by itself something that can add um, a cellular IoT to any device that can interface with it. Now, of course, it's designed for the Potenta X8 and the H7, but it's interesting that these things are built into the board, uh, the baseboard, rather than the board itself as add-ons. You can get hats for the Potenta H7 that do this, but this is a whole other kettle of fish, as it were. 
Anyway, it's clear that the Arduino Pro line is just that. It's uh, aimed at pros. Um, there's a reason why there's a big step up in cost when you go for any of the Arduino Pro kits, and that's because it is professional kit. It's a little bit out of the hobby range. That isn't to say that I wouldn't love to get a hold of one and play with one, um, but I think this is going to be more people who have a budget to start prototyping um, and, you know, really kind of throw some money at a project. It's still very interesting to me, though, and I'd be interested to hear what you think about it as well, because in theory, at least from where I'm standing, Arduino making these pro products is kind of an interesting step for the whole embedded market at this stage, because there's a lot of stuff out there that already does this, um, but it's not necessarily documented very well. And just getting up and running in the first place can be quite difficult. Whereas Arduino have had years of documenting things in a way that is easy for people to understand who maybe don't even have a technical background. Um, it's a kind of exciting time for that. Um, and also, it's just that thing, like I said, uh, like I've said many times before, it, I just, there's a, a great joy to me to think that now uh, we live in a world where one of the most popular MCUs out there is the Raspberry Pi Silicon, it's the RP2040, it's the big up, up and comer. And this is one of the more interesting single board computer and baseboard uh, c things I've seen in ages. It's a little Linux computer that's made by Arduino, the masters of the MCU uh, side of things for a while. Yeah, just, uh, just it didn't escape me that that's kind of interesting. So that was the Electromaker show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you for all the support that you are showing us. Um, if you would like to support us on YouTube by liking the video and all that kind of stuff, that's great. Of course, there is also the Electromaker store, as I mentioned earlier in the episode. But the most important thing for me is that you're having a fun, safe and a creative week and I will chat to you next time.